Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dario Health. Manage your blood glucose levels, increase your possibilities. By Jivo Kaipo Pen, the first premixed auto injector for very low blood sugar. And by Dexcom, take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, actor Kevin Coveas was one of the youngest contestants on American Idol back in season five. He'll share some behind the scenes stories, including managing low blood sugar during a live performance. And I'm singing and I just like, I can't wait for this thing to be over. I can't wait to stop singing and get the critiques from the judges that I'm not even going to really listen to because I got to get off the stage and I got to get some juice or I got to get some tablets. I got to take care of this. He was fine. And since Idol, Kevin has been working steadily as an actor. We'll talk about working in Hollywood with diabetes and during COVID, more about American Idol and how Kevin found himself mentoring other kids with type 1. He has advice for parents too. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to another week of the show. Always so glad to have you here. Hi, I'm your host, Stacey Sims. We aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. And my guest this week is Kevin Kovias, diagnosed with type 1 just as he turned 11. Kevin is best known for American Idol, as you heard in the tease there, and the Disney Channel show Good Luck Charlie, where he played the character Victor. He is a steadily working actor with roles in Transformers and This Is Us, The Rookie, NCIS Los Angeles, and more. I put some pictures of Kevin in the Diabetes Connections Facebook group so you can kind of see him on set. And he is appearing in the new Netflix series On the Verge, which is out this month. I thought it would be fun to just play a little clip of season five of American Idol where Kevin appeared. Now, this was back in 2006. As I said, he was one of the very youngest contestants. So here's a little bit of him from back then. And when all hope was left inside on that starry, starry night, you took your life as lovers so often do. I could have told you, Vincent, this world was never meant for one as beautiful as you. Starry, starry night. We used to watch Idol all the time. And as I confess to Kevin, it has been a while. But what a big show, right? And you'll hear Kevin during the interview mention Elliot Yamin who was also on season five and also lives with type one. I got to meet Elliot a couple of years ago at a Touched by Type One conference. He is he's still performing, writing music. He's now a dad. I'll put a link to Elliot's stuff in the show notes as well. And of course, we'll have tons of information about Kevin. But I just thought that was really interesting because to me, I don't know, it seems like yesterday, but of course, 2006 was the year that my son was diagnosed. Benny was diagnosed right before he turned two. He is now almost 17, which is, I mean, we've lived with diabetes now. I've been part of this community for 15 years in just a couple of weeks. So 2006 kind of was a long time ago and kind of seems like yesterday to me. All right, Kevin's interview coming up in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Jivo Kaipo Pen. And our endo always told us that if you use insulin, you need to have emergency glucagon on hand as well. Low blood sugars are one thing. We're usually able to treat those with fast-acting glucose tabs or juice. But a very low blood sugar can be very frightening, which is why I'm so glad there's a different option for emergency glucagon. It is Jivok Hypopen. Jivok Hypopen is pre-mixed and ready to go with no visible needle. You pull off the red cap, push the yellow end onto bare skin, and hold it for five seconds. That's it. Find out more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Jivok logo. Jivok shouldn't be used in patients with pheochromocytoma or insulinoma. Visit jivokglucagon.com slash risk. Kevin, welcome to the show. I'm really glad to talk to you. Thanks for, for making some time for me. Stacy, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to find we've been talking about this for a while. I'm so I'm so happy to finally uh, join join the program. It's great. Awesome. Yeah, it's great that we finally connected. Gosh, so much to talk about. We connected uh, every, when we see each other every year at Friends for Life. Yeah. And I was so happy we were able to do that this year. We'll kind of see what happens going ahead. But before we get into all of that, do you mind if we just kind of take a step back and look back? I mean, you haven't been on the show before, and I'd love to kind of revisit the early days of Kevin. 
if I could. Stacey, Stacey I would be disappointed if we didn't do that. So let's, okay. let's, let's please dive in. Let's do it. Yes, please. All right, well, I, you know, as I was asking that, I was thinking about American Idol, but I should probably yeah. go back further. You were diagnosed when you were, you were a kid. You were not even 11 years old yet, right? Yeah, it was just prior to my 11th birthday. Symptoms leading up. Yeah, my birthday's at the end of May. And I just remember that entire month of May so vividly. You know, obviously, you think back to childhood and, you know, memories here, memories there. But that month just stands out in my mind so vividly. Uh, symptoms throughout the month. Parents wondering, yeah, what's going on with Kev? What's, mm. what's happening? Uh, you know, maybe an infection, this, that. Bring me into the doctor several days prior to my 11th birthday to get the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Yeah. Did you spend your birthday in the hospital? I think it was, se- it, was, it was several days after my birthday. So, yeah, it was the entire month leading up to the birthday. And then it was, yeah, right at the start of June, I was put in. So this was several days after my 11th birthday that I was in the hospital. And just, you know, you hear the doctor tell you, and you're a kid. And, I, you know, I immediately, I broke down and cried. I didn't know, I didn't know what I was dealing with. I, you know, you hear the word diabetes and, you know, your mind escapes you. You start running around, all these different things. And then he, you know, the doctor, you know, kindly explained to me, no, this is something you're going to be able to manage in your life. It's obviously going to be a great deal of work, but this is something you live with and something you manage. And then from there, I learned everything <laughs> over the course <laughs> over the, of the next week and being in the hospital and getting treated. Yeah, it was uh, it was a month like no other though. Yeah, that's for I sure. Bet. So your kid, you're diagnosed at a time when frankly, it's the, as I recall, that time, that early 2000s, it's the time right before everything really started changing. Absolutely. As, as I look at it. I mean, Benny was diagnosed in 2006 and they were like, we've got this amazing thing called Lantus. That's yeah. just been approved for kids. Yeah. You know, yep. and now everything is, seems so different with the technology. What was the first kind of technology or routine that you were on? Gosh, you got me thinking back to the pre-Lantis days of type yeah, 1. Yeah, right? it's It's wild. Uh, for me, uh, taking the injections, taking the daily injections, I will uh, go ahead and say uh, I'm not currently on the pump, uh, that I am one of these those rare, rare people that uh, that takes daily injections. Yeah. I, I have a CGM, but that's, uh, that's my preferred way of doing it. I've been doing it that way for years. But yeah, uh, starting out, being diagnosed taking Humalin and Humalog uh, each and every day. Yeah, in those pre-Lantis days. And, you know, the, you think back to those syringes before you have the pens and the, the newer technology and the things that make it so easy now, so, so accessible. And thinking back to a time before, you know, we had some of those advancements. It was definitely interesting at the start for those first couple of years. Well, is that the kind of, and I say technology to encompass whatever you're using, shots. Of co- oh, of course. Whatever. Yeah. So, when you're talking Humalin, Humalog, did you have to kind of eat on a set schedule or were you okay to kind of inject when you wanted to eat? You know, that really came with adulthood, that sort of uh, injecting when I wanted to eat and the accessibility. I remember as a kid, it was it was the preference of my doctors to have that set routine. I remember going in and you have a regimented schedule of three meals, uh, several snacks, a snack at an after school snack at roughly 3 p.m. and a and one prior to bed, 9 p.m. at night. And yeah, that was for a while. It's obviously insulin matching exactly what you're, what you're ingesting, exactly what you're eating, and uh, set times. It was all very regimented for me those first couple of years of my life. Yeah, it was something. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Um, it's, it's a trip to think back on. It really is. Yeah. It must be. I mean, I just yeah. think, you know, it's, there's no easy age to be diagnosed with diabetes. No. But 11, you know, you're just starting out that like tiptoeing into independence. Yes. Middle school. Do you remember, did your parents kind of give you a long rope? Were they very protective? I don't want it to be too personal. No, please, curious. please. They were unbelievable. I'm so blessed to have the mother and the father that I do and the support system that I do. I think they handled it differently. I think uh, with my mother, I think not that there was more trust. I think there's maybe a little longer rope in trusting me to do the things. I think my father was you know, very concerned at times, but, you know, rightfully concerned about, you know, what I was taking and this and that. Um, so there were, I think there were several different schools of parenting going on, but together they complemented each other so well. And it was, I, I just knew that they were always there for me during those frustrating moments, those highs, those lows, quite literally, obviously, where it's just, they were there all the while, but just like an amazing support system. So I, I think they went about it slightly differently, but were, you know, managed to still be on the same page because no, you know, nobody handles, you know, one set situation quite the same. So yeah. I was just incredibly fortunate. We just got informed. It's like we figured out what it was. And there was a moment of kind of bowing our heads and being frustrated, being sad. And then we were like, all right, what do we do about this? And got in the hospital and took care of it and met up with all the, the doctors and got assigned the endocrinologist and, and took it from there. Yeah. 
your parents must have given you a long road because five years later, you auditioned for American Idol, right? Weren't you 16? I was a baby. I mean, I'm still a baby. I'm just an older <laughs> baby. I'm still probably just as immature, but now I'm in my 30s, so I don't really get away with as much. I <laughs> I was 16 years old, yeah, Stacey, when I did the show. I can't believe I did it at all, and I can't believe I did it when I was when I didn't know any. I mean, when I was just a, a, a child, yeah. That's so funny. So, okay, so you're my son's age when you yes, go for American there you Idol. Go. <laughs> and Not I, to you know, say your son's a child. I'm sure he's way more mature than I was at uh, 16, but yes. Uh, well, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I did let yeah. him just go. You know, he took an international trip for a month, but he was Amazing. with, you know, I, but he was with a bunch of people who, you know, were, we felt very safe with. Of course. What, what was the deal with American Idol? Because you didn't just go to one city, right? I mean, audition different cities. Take us kind of through it, what happened. It was just the journey of a lifetime at 16. I auditioned in New York. I'm from, I'm from Levittown, New York, Long Island, New York. And uh, I auditioned up in Boston. I turned 16. And I, as I tell the story, my mom and I would watch Idol from the Kelly Clarkson days. I ultimately was on season five, but you know, Kelly Clarkson wins the show season one. We, my mom and I, it's must see TV. We tune in every week to watch the show. And my father was never a big fan. And I was a singer around the same time that I was diagnosed with uh, diabetes at the age of 11. That's kind of when I joined the chorus and developed a love for singing and acting in the school plays and whatnot. And he'd walk through the room and we'd be watching Idol. And I would tell him, I'd say, you know, one day I'm going to do this show. And he's like, yeah, okay, we'll see. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I turned 16. And again, just to echo how incredibly supportive uh, my parents have always been, they've always been by my side. I turned 16. I go up to Boston to audition for the show. There were no tri-state area auditions in the, the greater New York area. They take me up to Boston. They take me up to Gillette Stadium where the New England Patriots play. They're having massive auditions, 15 tents set up on a field. Uh, a judge at each tent and four at a time, they're bringing us down and they say, sing, 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 sing. You sing a little bit of a song, they cut you off whenever they feel like you either make it or they send you to the exits. We see a herd of people going to the exits. And I was one of the lucky few that day who they said, you know what, we're going to give you another audition. We'll get, come back and see the executive producers, so on and so forth, all the way up to the main judges in the city of Boston. I see the original three of Simon Cowell, Paul Abdul, Randy Jackson. And uh, eventually I make my way out to Hollywood. I, I get past that round and made it to Hollywood. And it was my first time ever on the West Coast. Uh, I get to go and I'm one of maybe 180 people auditioning out in Hollywood to try to get on those live shows where ultimately I landed and gosh, got to somehow got to the top 12 of my season. I don't even know. I don't even, I don't even, it was honestly, Stacey, it was all a blur. I don't even know how I did it. I don't know. I mean, I remember it, but it was just a, yeah. such a roller coaster and such an emotional ride and such an exciting ride in my life. Yeah. When I'm researching to talk to you, you know, going through the American Idol season five and kind of looking at what was written around that time. Mm -hmm. There's no mention of you having diabetes. No, no. Were you hiding no. it? Right back to Kevin, finishing that thought. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dario Health. And one of the things that makes diabetes management difficult for us that really annoys me and Benny isn't actually the big picture stuff. It's all the little tasks adding up. Are you sick of running out of strips? Do you need some direction or encouragement going forward with your diabetes management? Would visibility into your trends help you on your wellness journey? The Dario Diabetes Success Plan offers all of that and more. No more waiting in line at the pharmacy. No more searching online for answers. No more wondering about how you're doing with your blood sugar levels. Find out more. Go to mydario.com forward slash diabetes dash connections. Now back to Kevin talking about why he didn't share his type one with the American Idol audience. Absolutely not hiding it. This is how little I <laughs> just knew about. I, I just wasn't aware of anything. I was so green to the experience that like now as an actor of 10 plus years as a mainly transitioned acting at this point, which I'm sure we'll get to a bit in a little bit. I didn't think about it from a perspective of, oh, wow, what a stage to raise awareness for this thing. I was on the show. I made it to the top 12. And one of my best friends from the show is Elliot Yamin, fellow type one. And, you know, great guy, great personality, and just just a heck of a voice. Oh, my God, the guy can sing the doors off the place. He's unbelievable. And we auditioned in Boston together. I was so nervous until my final few weeks performing live on the show. I just think I went in and I would do the interviews and I would do this and I would do that. And it wouldn't even occur to me like, man, you should really bring this up. I wasn't hiding it. I wasn't ashamed. I think for me, it was just such a normal part of my life that I'd been accustomed to for five years. And I was like, oh, yeah, well, I'm. Yeah, I'm no different than anyone else. I'm just dealing with my type 1 diabetes, you know, all the while. And it's it's a regret, not from a sense because, again, I wasn't hiding it. It's a regret 
because I realized how big that platform was. And I was like, oh man, I should have said something. I should have said something. And it was, and it wasn't until after the fact that I was like, oh wow, there's like a lot of opportunity here. And when I, you know, start to would, would do various events for the JDRF or really dive into work with the Diabetes Research Institute several years thereafter, it wasn't until that point when I kind of got older, where I was like, man, this is an incredible opportunity to raise awareness uh, and, you, you know, use your platform. And I wish I could go back and tell 16 year old Kevin that I really wish I could. <laughs> well, I wasn't even thinking of it in terms of advocacy, which is a terrific point that you make. Okay. But yeah. I was thinking about it as you're 16 and you know, to say, well, I need extra help or I need you to know that oh, yeah. I'm, although you weren't beeping at the time, you probably didn't have a CGM. No, not yet. 16, right. But you might, <laughs> not just you know, yet. and I think, and I can totally understand that because that's how my son is, yeah. you know, he'll tell people to be safe, you know, if he's yeah. spending the night and we're not there and he'll say, here's the, this and da, da, da. but he's not going to say, Hey, by the way, just as dropping it into the conversation. <laughs> yes. You know, I don't think a lot of 16 year olds who are, well, I shouldn't say it like that. I think and you've already kind of mentioned it, it just seems like it was such a normal part of who you were. I think that's very commendable. I think that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to think so as well. I'll tell you, every staff member on Idol, the producer, up to the producers, up to the the, the big time people behind the show, they knew I had type one. I always made it a point to, you know, school teachers, obviously, you're telling them, okay, hey, look, if I need to go to the nurse, this is why. I'm not not trying to get out of taking this exam. It's because I have a legitimate low right now. Uh, So the people in my life I was telling, it never occurred to me when the camera started rolling to bring it up because it just didn't occur to me. I was like, oh, yeah, no, I'm telling the people that are are directly affected in my life about this. It didn't it didn't even dawn on me to inform the audience about it. Did you have any issues on Idol with diabetes? I, mean, <laughs> I did. Yeah. Um, there's a story that stands out. I don't mean to laugh. It's just, you know. I, <laughs> oh, yeah. I had some hilarious stories about my diabetes. <laughs> hey, we know why uh, you're laughing. We get this it. is how we do it. Yeah, this is how we deal sometimes. You know, you know, you know better than anyone as do I. It's, um, it, it wasn't an issue up until the live shows, really. I, I think for me, it was always, okay, we're testing constantly. We're making sure we're correcting prior to getting up for big performances or whatever. I got to perform during Hollywood week. I'm making sure I'm good to go in in preparation for those performances. Uh, It wasn't until the third live show, there were three weeks of semifinals on the show. And I get up there on the third week and I'm waiting in the wings to be the next one up. And I, 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 I know where my blood sugar is, you know, without the CGM, I'm one of the lucky ones who can, you know, 21 years of this thing, I can tell where I am. If I'm running high in the 200s, I feel lousy and I know it. I know where I'm at. If I'm low and I have the shakes and you know, you feel a little disoriented. I know that too. And I could feel myself dropping and dropping quickly, but I'm, I'm due up on stage and it's live television. So I go up and I, I perform, I perform, uh, uh, Don McLean's, uh, starry, uh, Vincent starry, starry night, old ballad that, uh, one of my favorites, Josh Groban redid in, in, in more recent years. And I'm singing and I'm just like, I can't wait for this thing to be over. I can't wait to stop singing and get the critiques from the judges that I'm not even going to really listen to because I got to get off the stage and I got to get some juice or I got to get some tablets. I got to take care of this. It was the most surreal thing to be experiencing that in that moment. I got through it and the performance wasn't terrible. I think it was, I think it was one of my better ones. I was on for five weeks and I, I'd put it up in the maybe well, in the top two or three of them. And yeah, but that did happen uh, on live television, which was just the most surreal thing. Yeah. Wow. When you got off the stage, did you like eat everything? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I went to town. Stayed. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? I was like, yeah, let's go. I was just, <laughs> it was bizarre. It was just a, uh, not bizarre, but it was just a wild, wild thing to experience. And that's kind of telling for anyone who deals with this is that you can prepare to the best of your abilities and that, you know, that unexpected lower high could still come about. You just have to do your best. But there's no, there, there was no shame. I didn't feel any shame after that. I know, look, we're all human. And this is a, this is a normal part of the, the day in and day out experience, it's just so unique that to be in the position that I was in to have experienced it at that moment was very unique. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting too, that I forgot Elliot Yamin was the same season. Oh yeah. Good that's old wild. Elliot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. He was, I was ruined for him after I eventually got bounced and got kicked off. You know, I'm not kicked off after I got eliminated from the show. <laughs> um, I was like, I didn't get kicked off. No, I was a good kid. After I got eliminated from the show, uh, I was, I was rooting for Elliot anyway, not, I I mean, obviously the bond we shared is, as he was a fellow type one and we related and became fast friends over that. But I just thought he had the best voice out of anyone that season. I thought his voice was, you know, in in another league, but it was a, it was a heck of a year and a heck of a ride for, it really was. Do you still, all right, forgive me. I don't know if it's even on the air. Do you still watch Idol? Please. Uh, It is. (laughs) Not really. Um, You know, (laughs) it's been going on a while. Sometimes it's like, sometimes you got to know when to let go. 
I like emotionally said goodbye to the show. I think it was about five or six years ago now when when Fox had its last airing of the show. So I kind of had my emotional goodbye with the show then. I had a bunch of friends over to my place and we watched it and we were, you know, we were, and they were laughing about stuff. Remember in my time on the show years ago, we had a we had a grand time. And then a year goes by, Idol's off the air, and then ABC's picking it up because, you know, why not? Why, why yeah. not uh, pick it up? And they've had some successes with the ABC run and some and some very talented people on the show. But I think there's just, there's so many options now, so many things to watch. You got the voice, you got a, America's got talent, things of that nature. It's tough to, it's tough to keep up with all of them now. It's tough to keep up. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. So after Idol, you changed from being a singer to acting. What, what yeah. happened? Like, what were some of your first jobs? I know you were at the Disney Channel and, you know, you've been all yeah. these guest starring spots. So if you could tell yeah. me a little bit, like when you started. Yeah, I so I finished Idol, and I'm really honest about these things. I thought going into the Idol experience, as everyone does, I want to be a recording artist. I want to mm. make records, and I want to do this. And my love for music and my love for singing has never escaped. It's really, I'm, I'm just being honest, it's more of a hobby at this point. It's more of something for me. And if I record something, it's more for me or potentially to work, collaborate with friends or write with fellow musician friends. But I got into the acting. I remember I got done with Idol and I got management back. Uh, I found representation back home in New York. There was a real interest. I think people really found me to be a bit of a character on the show and in a good way, not a bad way, of course. <laughs> and that led to auditions. And I started going out and my first movie was a, a real silly kind of raunchy comedy. I wouldn't recommend anyone listening to this podcast watch it. But it was a movie called College. It was with a a Nickelodeon star uh, by the name of Drake Bell and various other funny people in the, you know, really funny people in, in the cast. And we had a blast making it. And this was my first taste of a film. And I, I came to know that uh, Deb Hagen, our director on that project, she was at home with her family reading the script of this movie. She'd just been assigned as the director and she's watching Idol with her family and I'm on the show and she's reading the script. And there's this, you know, kind of nerdy character named Morris Hooper, this kid with, you know, Heart of gold, sweet kid, but, you know, just kind of reserved and whatnot. She's reading the character and she's looking at me on the TV and she's like, man, this kid would be, I want this kid to play this role. Oh. <laughs> and I never knew this. And it takes a while to make a movie. And about a year later, uh, I, or within that year, I get done with Idol. I go back home. I'm doing my senior year of high school now because I did Idol as a junior in high school. I'm back in Levittown, New York. I'm back at Island Trees High School over there. And, and I'm, I'm doing self-tape auditions. I get a manager at home who starts sending me out for acting, saying there'd be quite a bit of interest if I were to pursue this. And I put myself down for this movie college and uh, put a self-tape down, and I got the role. I got the role, which off a of self-tape, yeah. which is like, you're so lucky to get that. It's a rarity, and I was very fortunate. And I, I had a fun time making that one, and then that led to a bunch of other opportunities. Got to work with uh, Lindsay Lohan on a, on a television movie called Labor Pains, which was a blast, a really stacked comedic cast in that one. You know, a silly movie, but a lot of fun. And then since then, uh, the big one was Good Luck Charlie for me. Got to be on the Disney Channel and work on eight episodes of Good Luck Charlie in the early 2010s. And, and then from there, just a slew of fun guest stars. And I'm just, I love it. I love every minute of it. I don't know how it all came about. I think for me, I always love to act just as much as I love to sing. But I never, I wasn't savvy enough at the time of doing Idol at 16. Again, I was so green. I didn't even think like, oh, you could use this Idol platform to maybe swing a few meetings or this or that and try to try to yeah. get your way into acting. I didn't even think like that. If it, Again, if it was today, if I was doing that in my 20s or if I was doing that today in my early 30s, like obviously I would have had that mindset. But, you know, you, you know I didn't know. I didn't know anything like that. So, But I'm just so fortunate that it came about. And I, I love it. I love being on set. I love playing these characters, escaping into these fun people that are nothing like me. It's fun. Yeah. And you've been, you know, you continually work. I mean, you yeah. know, it's, as you said, they're guest starring roles and, you mm -hmm. know, but they seem so fun. You know, this is us, 68 whiskey, you know, the yeah. rookie. Um, yeah. I think the last thing I saw was NCIS LA or Los Angeles. Yeah. Or whatever. I saw you that's, posted that's like a, a scene. During COVID, how has production been? Have you been able to do anything? That's, you know what, that's uh, a great question. My last two roles, which as you previously mentioned it, uh, NCIS Los Angeles, I got to do a, again, small role, bit part, but uh, a scene with with great actors and Chris O'Donnell and LL Cool J, the leads of the show. And that was just so trippy because, you know, you grow up watching LL and then you get to do a scene with him. I was like, I, it's like, I, I've done this for over 10 years and you still get in those situations and you play it cool, but it's like, I'm working with freaking LL Cool J. This is nuts. Um, <laughs> but that was interesting. I'll tell you, as it pertains to COVID, they were coming off a hiatus, the show. And this was, the, I believe this was their first episode of production back since COVID. I, I don't think I'm making that up. Mm. We go and we film at the Paramount lot, you know, the famous Paramount lot in Los Angeles. And um, 
And they took so many precautions. It's unbelievable. I, when you have a small, you know, a, a co-star role such as myself, they give you a tiny little trailer, whatnot. And everything's placed outside the trailer, your wardrobe, your sides, like there, nobody's coming into your trailer. It was a whole new world. Obviously, you're wearing a mask the entirety of the time that you're filming. Just a little funny story. My character is wearing like some sort of alligator costume. He's like a sign spinner on the corner of the street or whatever, who they take in for interrogation at the NCIS headquarters in LA. And uh, so they take me in and I'm still wearing this thing. And for the purpose of the scene, uh, I have the first line and I'm wearing a mask during rehearsal. We get in and obviously you're not shaking hands with anyone you're just meeting. You're there for a day. It's a quick day. And I'm wearing a mask in this like weird out, you know, this weird like lizard costume or whatnot. And and then when they, they start rolling, they're like, okay, everybody take your masks off. Kevin, you can take the mask off. I'm like, okay. So I, I don't know what's going on. I'm just following their lead. I take the mask off and I'm like, where do I put this thing? I don't have a pocket somewhere in a lizard costume. I just like kind of stick it under my butt and keep going with the scene. And then they call action and I run a scene with LL Cool J. It was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. I was like, but it's a whole new world, you know? So they take yeah. the precautions, but then they call action and you're back in a fictitious world that apparently doesn't have COVID-19 in it. Um, and it was just <laughs> bizarre. I was fortunate I had a small role a few weeks later on a show that has yet to be released, a show with Elizabeth Shue called On the Verge, which I believe is upcoming on Netflix. And I didn't get to shoot a scene with her, unfortunately, because she's amazing. But I had a really fun scene as a whole, as like a funny Whole Foods worker. And I got to shoot on, on that set. And again, they're taking all the precautions, um, you know, no contact. And you're getting COVID tested every other day because they need assurances that everyone on that set's safe, everyone on that set. This was pre-vaccination. This was at the end of last year when I worked oh, on wow. this project. So nobody had been vaccinated yet. You have to have assurances that nobody is, has tested positive for COVID. Otherwise, you got to shut the whole thing down. It was wild. But, you know, it's a whole new world out there. And we got to be we got to be safe and we got to be cautious, especially those of us with the pre-existing conditions like type one. Yeah. All right. So we're going to list in the show notes, we're going to put your IMDB so people can oh, figure out that they've already seen you a bunch of times. Yeah, yeah. You know, like um, my husband, and this is, well, it's not really embarrassing, but my husband is a big Transformers fan. Like we oh, watch all the Transformers movies. So I know you've been in those. So now I got to go back and like freeze frame and find you. Yeah, I just did one of the Transformers. I uh, I had a, a a funny, memorable scene with, uh, I think memorable, with uh, Mark Wahlberg in the, it would have been the fourth one. So it was... I can't even keep track of those movies I, I, He would know. I don't know. It was called Transformers Age of Extinction. And oh, yeah, the one with the dinosaurs. Yeah, there have been five total, I believe. Yes. There's dinosaurs, because why not? Because anything goes hey, in the Transformers universe. No doubt. No yeah. Doubt. And uh, I think Shia LaBeouf did the first three, and then Mark Wahlberg took over as the lead for the next couple, and I was in the fourth one. And yeah, that was nuts. I had... Uh, it was That was a, such a surreal experience, too. Well, when direct... you're working on a big, big, big budget... That was the hugest CGI craziness. Yeah. I mean, it must have been wild. That was the hugest thing, getting to shoot a scene with Mark Wahlberg and being directed by the very, uh, the very animated Michael Bay, who uh, it was was cool to me. But it was just like it was. I had to like pinch. I was like, how am I here right now? How did I get here? <laughs> like working on this with like huge names. Like this is nuts. Yeah, heck of a time. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. That's awesome. Well, I first met you. I first saw you at Friends for Life. Yeah. Uh, you were a special guest one year. I don't think we met the first year that I saw you speak. I don't think so. And then, you know, you've you've basically, Kevin, they kind of they, they've really adopted you. You were on staff this they did. year. did. Tell me a little bit about how you found the folks at Friends for Life, which I'm sure as you listen, you're familiar with they talk about it all the time, but the largest family diabetes conference in yeah. probably in the world at this point. Amazing. Um, and the amazing work that they do over at Children with Diabetes. Yeah, I was, like you said, I was kind of a stray dog who they like let into the house. They're like, all right, well, let's domesticate this guy and uh, maybe he could become a part of this. I'm so blessed. One of my, you know, dearest friends uh, is Tom Collier from the uh, Diabetes Research Institute, Diabetes Dad, as he's known. And Tom is one of the sweetest, most generous guys I ever met. And I did American Idol, not to take it back to Idol, but I did Idol. And he reached out to my father because I was still a kid at the time. And he was a fellow Long Islander and said, um, you know, I take part in this conference and they do amazing work and I would love to bring Kevin down. I had the summer free. I didn't make the American Idol tour, so I had the summer free. <laughs> and uh, and he, he asked to, if I would come down to perform at the banquet for the 2006 uh, Friends for Life conference in Orlando, Florida. And I was very excited, but I didn't know what I was getting into. I didn't know what this conference was. I didn't know that such an amazing organization existed. So I go down and I, I sing uh, You Raise Me Up, which was the Josh, again, to bring up Josh Groban, the song that I sang on Idol, auditioned with. And uh, I sing it. And uh, 
it was just amazing. I had such an incredible time and I learned more about this, what this conference was and learned of the support system that people had. And I think I was just so naive. I didn't realize that something like this even existed. And it just opened up my eyes. It opened up, up my eyes to how many people care about people in this yeah. world. And I, I knew, you know, to an extent, you know, around home in New York, you know, when I met these people, when I met Jeff Hitchcock, when I met Laura and all these amazing, Laura Billadu and all these amazing people at the conference, I, it was instantly just felt like family. Um, I would go back several years thereafter, I think in 2009, and then again, maybe in around 2012, 2013 as a special guest. And I kept going back as a special guest. And it was fun because initially I was there as kind of a guest who was promoting Idol. And then and then a younger generation of the kids that would go, I'd get to be a special guest and talk about Good Luck Charlie on the Disney Channel. And that was a, a great fun. But then I would go and I would take part in, in the conference a little bit. And then I would just kind of find myself walking around and saying hi to people and popping into the, uh, you know, the exhibition room and popping into Sports Central and playing basketball with the kids. And I was like, I want to do more here. I want to do more. I got in touch with Laura and they ended up asking me the next year, like, we've had you as a special guest. Would you want to come back and be a staff member here? And I was like, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I just wanted a, I wanted a bigger role. And they were so gracious as to offer me one. And now I'm just like part of the gang, which is always more fun for me anyway, because I never feel important. I never feel special. Like, it's just like, I'm just one of the gang. I'm just like you. I'm just like this kid who has it. I'm just like this, you know, it's unbelievable getting to go there every year. They asked me to be on the teen staff. And I think this past summer, yeah, uh, was my fourth fourth year on the teen staff. And I just want to go back every year. Every year they'll have me. I want to go back. Yeah. It is amazing when you don't have that community connection and then you find it. We were kind of by ourselves. I, I live near Charlotte, but I don't live in Charlotte. And it seems like everybody I knew with type one, with kids with type one, lived further away from me. And then in 2010, Children yeah. with Diabetes brought a conference to Charlotte. Amazing. They used to have these regional uh, focus on technology conferences. And I went, and that was where I realized, oh my gosh, there's all these other people. There's this community. And it really inspired me to get more connected. Course, and now I'm, yeah. I'm so lucky. We have people not, you know, you hate to have more people diagnosed, but we have more people in my area. We have, sure. you know, more connections. So I hear you. But working with the teens, as you said. Yes. I think that's a pretty hard group. What do you do? How do you kind of get through to them or talk to them? It can be. It can be. I, I love it personally. I, I, I think I'd be more nervous to work with the younger kids uh, <laughs> just in terms of, I don't know, just holding their attention or whatnot. I think back to being 16 and I think back to the time I did Idol, it's such a vulnerable time in your life. I, I think that more than anything else is that teenagers might act out or whatnot, but it's just stemming from insecurities or feelings of vulnerability about, vulnerability about certain things in their life. And it's like, you just kind of have to, you know, give them a pass for that and try to break through the best you can. I mean, that's what I do. I, you know, I never grew up a camp counselor. I never did any of that. So when I go to this thing, I look to friends of mine who are in the teen group now, some of my best friends now who are on the teen staff with me that I've met at the conference throughout the years. And I watch them do it. And I'm like trying to take notes because some of them are really good at it. And I'm like, well, it's tough, but it's tough to break through sometimes, I think. Yeah. I'd be curious too, as a parent of a teen, I don't know one parent of a kid with type one, of a teenager with type one who says, oh, my kid is perfect, right? They're doing right. such a great job. I'm so happy with all of their management. Of course, yeah. You know? And I, I'm wondering if there's any advice that you have as being somebody who is closer to being 16 than I am, certainly, and who has worked with these kids. You know, what can we as parents do to support them? That's an incredible question. I think I was naive going into all this to see, not that I didn't have struggles, but to have a support system at home like I did, where I think my parents, they were always aware of what's going on in my life. But I think it's such a give and take where obviously my father, my mother spent 24 hours a day worrying about me as a kid with my diabetes, but not letting it show all the time and giving your child the space to sort of operate and trusting them in a, in a way, take off the training wheels and trust them to make their own decisions. Obviously, if, if they need you, you're there. But also give them space, but don't smother them, I guess. I, it, it's a tough road. You know, I'm not a parent, uh, so I'm not one to really comment on it. I can only approach it from that former teen perspective with my parents was, I think my parents always did an amazing job on Idol as well. I saw stage parents on Idol. I saw, you know, parents who were like, oh, you're going to sing this song. You're going to do that. My, my folks always said to me, you know, Kevin, we're here for you. We love you. Um, if you need help with something, let us know. But this is your thing. Obviously, you can't maybe take such a lax approach in a certain way with diabetes, but it's informing your child to the best of your abilities, always being present, always being there, but also letting them breathe and make their own decisions. I, I, I think if you can find that balance, it's really important because you see kids who don't necessarily have that or you meet kids. And I was naive. I thought everyone was like me who had it. I thought everyone was like, 
you know, had their ups and their downs and but good days and bad. But sometimes it's a rough road. And I, I'd open my eyes to that, just like going to the conference and just like going around and meeting people who have it. It's yeah, it's not easy, though. That's for sure. Before I let you go, Kevin, your type one diabetes, if I've got my math right, is about to turn 21. Or oh, yeah. 21? Yeah, it's about to. Yeah, I, my, <laughs> I could go out and go to the bars now with my, exactly. with my type one. Yeah, I won't. But I'm certainly not going to ask you to, you know, to sum everything up and tell us what you've learned or, you know, anything like that. Yeah. But I, I am curious, you know, you now, as I said, you use a CGM, you use, mm-hmm. you still have injections, you use mm-hmm. multiple daily injections, but it's different insulin. You know, things yeah. have come a long way. You found the community to support you. Anything you would tell your 11-year-old self about oh my what's gone, you know, what you've been through? I'd say congrats. I mean, it's been a wild ride. And I, look, I haven't done things perfectly and nobody's perfect. I think you got to give yourself a break. I think I've spent a lot of times kind of hard on myself from like a career perspective, as a singer, as an actor, and especially with my type one, it's easy to be hard on yourself. It's easy to, I think... We go through these like ups and downs with this with this thing that we live with every day of our lives, and I, I can recall like low points of like a really bad low or you know episodes that we all sort of experience with this thing from time to time. I recall like the immediate thing you feel is ashamed, a shame that you allowed it to get to that point. I think if I could tell my younger self something, it's like don't be ashamed. This is a part of the ride. Some days are amazing, some days stink. It's just a fact. No one's per- going to be perfect ninety you know one hundred percent of the time. It's just not. It's not possible. So. I think I would tell my younger self, I would say congratulations on achieving some of the stuff you've done, but also like, way to go. Just, you know, get getting through it, <laughs> getting through this grind, you know? <laughs> yeah, I do know. That's yeah, fantastic. You know it, you know it so well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I know it as a parent, which is a different story, but that's fabulous. It's a huge way to know it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Absolutely. Kevin, thank you so much. But I just thank you for having me. Yeah. Oh, it's been wonderful to talk to you. I hope you'll yeah. come back. Keep us posted. Let us know when to look for you. I will. And, yeah. And- And hopefully time will go fast and we'll see you next summer at Friends for Life. That would be amazing. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information about Kevin and links to what he's doing now and links to some performances from Idol back at season five at diabetes-connections.com. Every episode from 2020 on has a transcription with it as well. I'm trying to go back and fill in the blanks on the previous episodes, but boy, there are a lot of them. So I'm doing the best I can. But you can always find the information that you need, hopefully, for each episode there at diabetes-connections.com and pop in the Facebook group. If you have any particular questions for me, you can always reach me at stacy at diabetes-connections.com. And Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And I was watching only murders in the building the other night. Are you watching this show? It's on Hulu, so I know not everybody gets that, but it's such a fun and interesting comedy. It's not quite as funny and silly as I thought it was going to be, and that's not a bad thing, with Steve Martin and Martin Short and Selena Gomez. And the reason I started watching it, no surprise, is because they have a podcast. And some of the podcasting stuff is very silly, but it's fine. I love it. It's not really too far-fetched. Let's just put it that way. And it's just a good show. But I got way off the subject. We were watching this. I was watching it by myself, actually, when I got a Dexcom alert. And Benny was upstairs. Um, He was playing video games or doing whatever he's doing upstairs. And, you know, I was just thinking about how we had blood sugar checks on a timer. We had a schedule. I'm sure a lot of you did this, too, before CGM. We would check doing a finger stick the same time every day at home and at school and whenever extra we needed to. It's amazing to think about how much our diabetes management has changed with share and follow. I mean, I didn't stop the show to get up and check him. I knew what was going on. I could decide whether to text him or if I needed to go upstairs and help him out. Using the share and follow apps have helped us talk less about diabetes, which I never thought would happen with a teenager. And he loves that part too, trust me. That's what's so great about the Dexcom system. I think for the caregiver, the spouse, the friend, you can help the person with diabetes manage in the way that works for your individual situation. Internet connectivity is required to access Dexcom follow. Separate follow app required. Learn more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Quick look ahead and a bit of a change in the schedule. I was set to go, like many of you, to the Children with Diabetes Conference happening in White Plains, New York, the weekend of October 9th, but they have moved that to a virtual conference. And I totally understand, you know, you've got lots of kids, uncertain situation with Delta. So that will be in November now, and it is a virtual event. I will put information in the show notes so you can find out more about that. 
We did virtual with them, gosh, really all of 2020, of course. And it's a lot of fun. I think they do a great job. And one of the cool things they figured out early at Friends for Life and Children with Diabetes, you know, Children with Diabetes is the organization, Friends for Life is the event. They figured out how to help people socialize outside of the speeches and the reports and the talking, which are all great. The presentations, I think, are very valuable. But for me, the socializing is a huge part of why I enjoy these conferences. And they have these little virtual hallways where parents can drop in, kids can drop in, teenagers, young adults, that kind of thing. So worth checking out just for that. I'm disappointed, obviously, that we're not in person, but I'm still going to New York because this conference is 15 minutes from where my sister lives and I haven't seen her in ages. So I'm going to go see her and hang out. And hopefully, Melissa, if you're listening, and I'm sure you're not, we're going to all the places where we ate in high school that weekend. So be prepared. We're going to Maria's Pizza. We're going to the diner. We're going to make a list. So we, we grew up not too far from where she lives now. So that should be a lot of fun. Later in the month, I'm going to be in Scottsdale, Arizona for She Podcasts, which is a terrific female podcasting conference, as you would imagine. I'm really excited about that. And look, we'll just have to wait and see how these things go, because certainly events are touch and go at this point. Diabetes events, people are much more cautious and, and rightfully so. So we'll wait and see. But hey, that doesn't mean that we can't hang out. We can't socialize. My local group is doing stuff online. I'm happy to come and speak to your group virtually. I've still got my book to clinic program. I am working on book two. I am so excited. So still a lot going on. But man, I know I can't wait to get, are we going to get back to normal? I don't know. But I'd like to get back to something else, something where we socialize more. We hug more. We see each other more. Hang in there. Oh, my goodness. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I've got In the News every Wednesday live on Facebook, and then we turn that into an audio podcast episode every Friday. So please come back and join me for that. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you in a couple of days. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.